Alan Claudine, welcome to Digital Decisions. Before we dive into learning more about the Open Institute and Kenya's digital transformation journey, Al, can you share with us a bit more about your personal story from moving from tech entrepreneur to civil society leader? Well, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, you know, when I started out in, in business in general, I started out with a small, um, a very small business called Multiple Choices. And what we were trying to do at the time is that we were a little bit ahead of our time because here in Kenya at that time, um, not many people had mobile phones. Uh, mobile phones costed uh, the equivalent of about three, four thousand um, dollars. Not many people had computers. In fact, where most people went to access um, their internet was in the cyber cafe. And in the cyber cafe, they would be paying something like um, a dollar um, per minute. So it was, it really was a, a, a very, you know, complicated time. Um, but multiple traces was geared towards supporting enterprises, large companies and so on, to have intranets, to have websites. Um, we were building things like, um, I think our biggest call to fame at the time is that we built um, Africa's first um, and possibly only um, blog uh, software. Um, it was called um, Teupe. Um, and it, you know, WordPress, of course, came and, uh, and took it over, um, took over that space. But we were fortunate enough to be able to sell the company to a, a large uh, corporate and uh, made a little bit of money from the sale of the business. But while I was running that, um, that business, we, had, um, we found ourselves in a position where, as an industry, um, there was a challenge uh, because of the fact that um, there was no coherent um, ICT policy in Kenya. There was no strategy. Um, really, the concept of um, ICT was, was shrouded in telecommunications, which was really copper wires. Um, so while I was running my business around 2005 is when the government actually set up um, the, the Ministry of ICT. Um, and um, one of my friends, Jay and I, we went and volunteered um, and said, we'd like to write the policy and the strategy for Kenya for, um, uh, for ICT um, going forward so that then it will cover um, some of the business challenges that we were having. Um, the government so, was very welcoming. Um, they listened to us, they agreed um, to allow us to uh, write the policy. And so we built something called ICT Village which was essentially a community of ICT professionals in Kenya to come and um, put together this policy. Um, a year down the line, um, the president accepted um, that policy and that actually became Kenya's um, strategy for, for ICT um, that uh, has gone on until uh, a year or two ago. And where did the concept of beginning to focus on control of data and management of the data coming? Oh, that came in um, much later. You see, um, the, this strategy that we created had uh, several bus stops. Um, bus stop number one was making sure that we have fiber optic cable um, in Kenya. Bus stop number two was to make sure that people had access. And so we were trying to figure out um, how people can have cheap phones, how they can have laptops, how they can have um, you know, a uh, proliferation of, of centers and cyber cafes around the country where they would go and access the internet from. And then we had to have a content strategy, which was bus stop number three. Um, E-government was bus stop number four. And then bus stop number five was data. And so over time, this was actually being done. Um, and at some point when I had sold my business in 2006, I actually joined uh, government to actually support some of this um, development um, work. And then um, in 2010, we felt that um, Kenya had achieved a lot of those other bus stops. And we felt that it was time for um, uh, the government to actually go and, uh, and have it. And so we started sort of having those conversations around data in 
late 2010, early 2011. Um, and in 2011, I think around April or no, I think it was around March, uh, we went to see the government and said, guys, I think it's time that um, we um, had open data because at that time the open data um, sort of uh, movement was, was picking up momentum quite a bit. Uh, and when we had done that, um, you know, we, we convinced the Ministry of ICT that it was time. And so the minister, the PS in charge of ICT at the time, uh, is Ambassador Bitangin Demo today in Brussels, um, he immediately said, we need to go and see the president about this. Um, so we went to see the, so we said, okay, well, you go to see the president and then you'll tell us what, what he says. He said, no, 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 we need to go see the president about this. So we went to see the president. Um, the president listens to this story and then he says, um, he gives us a date for launch. He says, yeah, great. This is a good idea. Um, can we launch it eight weeks from today? So suddenly uh, we come from seeking the blessings of the government to actually putting together an, an initiative very, very quickly. So we built a task force um, that had very many um, stakeholders um, in the task force. And we achieved the, the president's deadline of, uh, of eight weeks. So once we had succeeded in that, um, some of our friends at the World Bank felt that um, Jay and I were such a good team and that we, we had done such a good job with, uh, with convincing Kenya to, um, uh, to do open data that they thought that we could evangelize open data in other places. And so we actually had to go to Ghana Tanzania, Moldova, and a few other places to evangelize open data. And we're happy that most of those countries that we went to um, established an open data um, initiative. So it was in that moment that it became clear to us that, you know what, our thing, our, you know, the, the, the piece of the world that we feel that we can bite is to get countries to be transparent, is to get countries to be more open is to figure out what systems, what processes, what tools, what ideas governments needed so that they can be transparent for the people to um, engage better. Um, and that's how Open Institute was started. In fact, you know, the, the, it was not meant to be called the Open Institute. It was meant to be called Center for Open Governance and something. I, I, I don't actually remember the entire phrase, um, but it was a long phrase. Um, and eventually we just said the Open Institute and it worked. So there's uh, some lessons there maybe in uh, kind of the power of uh, high level political will and a big forcing function of eight weeks and you're going to be <laughs> Yes, indeed. In fact, well, that's a, I usually say that that's the, the good thing and the bad thing um, as far as um, some of these projects are concerned because many of them are not backed by law. Openness, transparency are not backed by law. So they depend a lot on the whims um, and the blessings of the political class. When elections come and the political class changes, um, many of these initiatives um, tend to die. So that's the double-edged sword, I think, of, of some of these initiatives. If they have the blessing, they go very fast. Um, if they don't have the blessing, then they crash and burn. Yeah, fair enough, and can change quickly, as you said. Um, yes. Claude, I just want to add one other question. Could you talk <laughs> a little bit about how you define open and open data and be specific for that because you know that that phrase gets used a lot but i think people have very different definitions for what that is and what it means and why it's so important so for for me openness comes from the perspective that um, governments and societies are owned by people and not by the people who are in power. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the first point that I like to make, that openness means that it means an acknowledgement of where the power lies, and the power lies in the people. Number two, if the power lies in the people, it then follows that the people who are working for, you know, the office, officials who are working for the people must then be very open um, to um, those people and tell them what it is that they're doing. When I go to meet communities and I'm trying to explain the concept, I usually explain it um, 
in the context of, um, I usually explain it in the context of um, a shop. So think about a shop. Um, I go and I open a shop and then I say, Claude, I want to employ you um, to manage my shop. Um, the shop doesn't become Claude's shop. It's, it remains my shop. And it's Claude's responsibility to report to me, to make sure that I can come at any point and take stock. Um, I can come at any point and look at the cash flow and so on and so forth. That's kind of the, the important aspect of openness. And so openness for us is transparency, number one. It is building trust in government, number two. It is uh, being accountable um, to citizens, number three. And it is being engaging. So being responsive, listening to what the citizen needs, and then making sure that you do what they want rather than what you uh, may think is just good for them. So, Al, we touched on it a little bit, but the Open Institute does hands-on data work, works to strengthen citizen understanding of data use, and advises the government to develop responsible data governance policies. So you talked a little bit about citizen engagement and government engagement. Can you share with us your approach to how these two, uh, two approaches might overlap with one another? Okay, so the Open Institute does um, a couple of things. Number one, we do um, we focus a lot on promoting responsive governments, and the way that we define responsive governments is that they a are transparent with the citizens, b they have developed strong listening mechanisms so that they can listen to the needs, the whims, the desires of the people. Um, and three, that they have the ability to um, respond um, effectively to those needs. Um, so what we do is that we make sure that, the way that we do it is that we make sure that we provide government with whatever it is that they need for them to be responsive. If they come to us and say, we need tools, the, the gap is that tools are not there. We make sure we provide the tools or we find a way for them to have the tools that they may need. If they say to us, we don't have the right policies in place, then we figure out a way to mobilize um, whichever stakeholders are there so that a policy can actually come um, into place. If they say um, that it's knowledge that we don't have, then we will do whatever it takes to find the necessary knowledge and knowledge lies and tends to lie with the people. We find whatever knowledge, whatever data, whatever analysis they need so that they can be able to effect um, and be responsive and be responsive. On the other hand, we work a lot with citizen groups and we try and figure out how citizen groups can take advantage of a transparent government. So the government has been transparent. If the citizens then don't, you know, sort of uh, latch on to that transparency and provide guidance to the government, then what tends to happen is that um, there's, a, there's a gap, there's a, there's a mismatch. Um, and so a lot of the work that we tend to do is to, um, figure out how we can we can do that, excuse me. So we work, um, so when we, when we are working with citizen, uh, um, citizen groups, we tend to work a lot with um, civil society organizations, we tend to work a lot with community-based organizations, especially because they live within the community. And we, we try and figure out how do we strengthen them? How do we give them more um, tools, knowledge, um, so that they can be able to better serve um, the community. So these two things must come together and sort of gel so that then you have a successful um, society. Um, so a lot of the work that we do um, involves technical support. It, um, it involves um, research. It involves data collection um, together with communities um, and together with governments. Um, and we, we tend to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what are the best ways, what are the simplest ways um, to achieve this. So as a result, we are very, very experimental. And I want to, I want to build just a little bit on both a shop analogy, but then also kind of dig into that citizen engagement side. Could you talk a little bit more about 
to you, what does it mean to be sort of an active citizen? And like, what should people really be doing to kind of be engaged in the use of their data? And I know you all have a couple of programs that sort of really focus on fostering that. Could you explain yeah. to the listeners sort of what are some of those programs and, and why you kind of chose those approaches? I was thinking okay. specifically your kind of open county approach as well as the ability program. Right. So um, let, let me start from here. What, what does active citizenship mean for us? Active, active citizenship for us means that a citizen has the knowledge of what government is doing. They have the confidence to be able to show up and engage with that government. Um, and being that they're not just going to be passive and sit and listen. Um, in many public participation meetings that we have seen, citizens come in, the government comes in late, um, makes a presentation, usually in English, and then they go away. And you know, then they, you know, there's nothing that citizens can say that they gained um, from that interaction. But active citizenship for us means more than just going and voting every five years. It means being involved um, in what um, needs to be done within the community. It means guiding government and telling them this is how we want development done in our area. Um, and so the kind of projects that we have um, or the kind of programs that we have that are helping us in this direction. Um, on the government side, we have been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how um, our subnational governments, especially, can start out open. They only start, we only started having subnational governments in 2013. And so we try to think about how do we start those governments open? And we provide them with a, with a platform um, such as um, our opencounty.org platform so that all county data can, um, can be easily accessed. Um, we have provided them with a platform called Devolution Hub so that any documents that are produced by any county or by any civil society organization or business about any county can be um, easily located. But then we have gone a little bit further to try and figure out how counties themselves can start to publish their own data on their own um, websites. Um, so that then it becomes easy for their, for their um, citizens to um, you know, get that data and, and, and sort of um, engage um, from that perspective. A really good example I could give you is, uh, is Nandi, which um, recently won the OGP award for, for that initiative. Um, Nandi County is, is a county, is an agricultural county. It's a fairly small county um, in the Rift Valley. And what we do with them is that we went and, and got their buy-in um, first, um, you know, from the leadership. And then after that, we started working with them to identify an officer from every single department, bring those officers into one group um, at the planning ministry, and get those um, officers to scavenge and look for data from their departments all kinds of data from their departments and bring it to the center where everybody is and then start to overlay that uh, data, make sure that we are analyzing it together so that eventually you're having a story like this. Um, on day X, many children did not go to school. They, they, so the, ministry, the education department comes in from information that there's been absenteeism this week from school. But the health department has noticed that only 10 students came, um, but they all had tuberculosis. That immediately tells you that you need to do mass testing of not only the children who did not go to school, but even the others who went to school to make sure that you can quickly contain the situation. Those sort of um, things can only happen if you have a working, seamlessly working um, data desk that is within um, the county. And so this data desk is the one that we spent a lot of energy putting together. And once the data desk um, system has been working very well, like in the case of Nandi, El Geo, Maracuete, and a few other counties, then the next thing that we do is that we provide them with a platform so that they can publish the data. So if you went to the Nandi um, uh, county website, you will actually find uh, a data dashboard there um, that where they're sharing all kinds of data including how much milk is produced in Nandi and, and what are the indicators for health and education and so on and so forth. 
And the goal for us is to make sure that that data becomes so real time, uh, as real time as possible, so that then people can actually use it to make decisions. As it is right now, we are starting to see um, in places like Ilifi, civil society organizations starting to work together using the data that the county has provided to actually hold the, count the county to account um, on, on specific things, to um, tell the county what it is that they prefer is done. Um, and so that for us is a very exciting thing. So Al, you've brought up a lot of interesting points like how to create seamless data systems between education and health. Um, and as digital public infrastructure becomes a more pressing topic around the globe, the use of citizen data from identity, payment systems, health, everything you just mentioned has become a big topic. And I know Kenya just recently faced this debate with WorldCoin. Can you tell us about this story and what happened? <laughs> the WorldCoin story? The WorldCoin story is one that raises my blood pressure, um, uh, you know, every time I, I, I sort of have to think about it. Um, a couple of things. Number one is that um, in Kenya, we are, we, are, we are starting to see a renaissance in terms of um, systems, um, technological driven systems. Um, and we are starting, and we have been seeing um, that we are ahead of many African countries because we have very good um, connectivity. Um, we have very smart people, um, and as a result, um, there's a lot of entrepreneurship that is happening around um, technology. Our government has been very um, aggressive in also leveraging technology to have um, excellent systems. You know, so we've we've. For example, this current government has done some really good work in terms of saying that they are digitizing over 5,000 services so that I, I can literally get government services from where I'm sitting right now um, through, a, through a platform called the eCitizen platform. Um, as we have been going through that process, um, we have been fortunate to also be ahead of the curve in terms of getting a very good and proactive data uh, protection office. Um, so we have um, a data protection law in place and we have a data protection commissioner um, uh, who, um, call, who's called Immaculate Kasaid. who's actually very, very, very good and switched on about these things, which helps. Now, in the course of time, um, we saw that um, last year, I think it was around, I want to remember, it might've been around September, um, we saw a, an interesting thing that there was huge queues of people that were, were, were made around our uh, conference center in Nairobi, uh, our main conference center in Nairobi called the Kenyatta International Conference Center. And I'm when I'm talking about huge groups of people, I'm talking about close to a thousand people on any given hour. And we were wondering what's going on. And when we checked, we found that it was a situation where people were going to get WorldCoin. So I want you to note that what people knew that was happening is that they were going there to get WorldCoin. Because of the fact that they had interacted with Bitcoin before, and they saw that Bitcoin used to be $1,000, uh, you know, not too long ago, and now it's, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars or more, they were like, here's an opportunity for us to get a new coin that will make us rich. Kenyans are like that. We're very entrepreneurial. We think about, you know, how can we uh, become rich? When they go there, they're told, well, you first have to go and take your picture in this silver orb. Um, and many of them just did it. When we checked, we found that it was actually biometrics that was being collected. They were scanning the iris. And the iris is actually the most, it's, it, the, the, I, it's not a lie that people say that um, eyes are the, the gate to the soul. That, you know, when you get my iris uh, data, you've really gotten into my soul. Um, it's even more personal than fingerprints. And so we found that people are literally being scanned without their permission, without knowing what they're doing. Um, and so immediately we called the government and they said, hey, uh, are you guys concerned? And they said, you know what, these guys had come and they had gotten a, a data protection, some of the data protection, um, they had met some of the data protection requirements but they did not get um, this level of um, approval for biometrics. And so it's true, we do have to stop them. But we're getting um, uh, pushback from them 
because they're saying that they're making people sign a document and therefore it is willing by willing seller. And, you know, government has difficulty in getting into um, contracts. But we said, but this is a national security issue. If there was a Ponzi scheme that was um, being, where many people were being swindled, the government would come in and stop it. This is very much um, some kind of Ponzi scheme that is happening because of the fact that it may not be stealing money from people, but it's certainly, it's certainly stealing the identities. And this is important. And because of the fact that these people do not understand what they're signing, because they're not given the chance to understand what they're signing. The document is a four page, five page document of fine print. Um, some of the things that the document says is that you cannot um, fight it. And if you feel disgruntled, then you have to go to San Francisco where the, the company has its um, offices and get an arbitrator only from there. Um, you cannot get an arbitrator from Kenya. The company's registration, um, as we would find out, is Tools for Humanity Germany, but it had a mothership um, from the Cayman Islands and another one from Delaware, and you know it was very confusing. And so we were like, "Oh, there's no way that our citizens understand what it is that they're signing, and therefore it is important that we just stop them in their tracks." Um, Thankfully, government agreed with us, and as a matter of national security, um, the World Coin was stopped um, from, from continuing to collect the data. Um, they, it became a parliamentary discussion um, in, in Kenya, and it became a very, very big discussion about um, what was happening. And for us, it became um, a good clarion call, a good warning sign of what um, could happen if we do not put our act together and make sure that we are protecting our people uh, better from successful um, international companies that would use their, their money and their, and their power um, to get data from, from Kenyans. Um, so the, the WorldCoin story is one where I think the whole world um, might benefit in, in thinking about how to protect citizens' um, data protection rights. Um, the ways that government must be proactive now, because what, what um, WorldCoin is doing in terms of proof of identity is very laudable. It's ahead of its time, it's important, it's needed because of how fast um, AI is taking root. But you cannot do it without making sure that people understand what you're doing, why you're scanning viruses, why you're taking uh, biometrics. So so just for people who may not be quite as familiar with WorldCoin um, as you are, and so essentially what WorldCoin was, WorldCoin, uh, for those who haven't been tracking this, I guess, uh, is essentially a Bitcoin operator uh, that was interested in Kenya, primarily because, as I understand it, um, the how forward Kenya is in terms of mobile payments. And as you said, sort of the entrepreneurial um, nature of your people and sort of really saw this as I think is a great proving ground or test market for how one might transform society using Bitcoin and using it as currency. I'm not sure if I have that you 100% know, right, but. You know, I, let me let me just clarify a couple of things that, mm. that are really important here. Number one is that um, in many countries that WorldCoin has gone, they, they have been giving people financial and other incentives for them to do the scanning. If you're doing something for the public good, you don't need to give them um, financial and other incentives. They will come because they understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. In some countries, they were providing them with airports. In other countries, they were providing them with money. I think in Indonesia, they were providing them with um, money, actual hard cash. In Kenya, um, the way that they came is to provide us with WorldCoin. But this is not a Kenyan problem. This is a global problem because I think um, uh, at the time that we were stopping them in Kenya, they were in the UK, they were in Spain, they were in um, several countries in Asia. They were the only country that I think they, they just were not in, it was in the US. And one of the questions that I think the rest of the world would ask is, why would they not be in the US? Why are they not collecting the same data in the US, where they are from? You cannot go to somebody else's house um, to do stuff if you cannot do the stuff in your own house. Um, that tells you that there's, there's a malevolent 
um, aspect to um, to the data collection that was happening. So I, I wouldn't want to frame it as a Kenyan problem. I frame it as a, as a global problem that all of us have got to be um, extremely aware of because data protection is a global um, issue. And we have to think about globally about how businesses can engage. One of the main principles that um, I think I am very clear about is that um, a private company cannot provide me with proof of identity. Identity comes from someone that I have a social contract with. And the social contract I have is with the government. This company, if you look at the fine print that they had provided, um, did not rule out the, the ability to sell my data to somebody else. Um, governments will not do that. And so that's why I think some of these principles are important for us to stand by, they're important for us to fight for as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I was just using that early part as sort of a precursor to the next part, which is, I think, where WorldCoin uh, faced probably a new um, sort of resistance that they had not actually seen in many Indeed, other yeah. markets was actually because of the Open Institute and because of sort of calling that out. And, and it does raise, as you said, some really incredibly important things about uh, where anything can be legislated, what people are seeing in terms of the waivers, in terms of service that are being done, and who actually has the right to store or capture data in that way. Um, and I was curious if you could just build on that a little bit and talk about, you, you talked about some countries in Europe, other locations with WorldCoin, but what are you seeing as you work with governments across Africa? Because as you said, it's this example is about WorldCoin, but this is not a unique problem of a company, particularly one that isn't based in the country or endorsed by the government, coming in and collecting and storing and potentially selling other data. How are you seeing that play out in other with other countries that you've been working with? You mentioned Ghana, Moldova, others. Well, I, I can tell you that um, Kenya is a little bit ahead in terms of our activism, um, so to speak. But um, you can clearly see that in places like Ghana, um, where there are organizations like the um, Africa Digital Rights Hub um, uh, in Nigeria and a few other places, where you're actually seeing, um, you know, like the Paradigm Initiative in, in, in Nigeria and in um, Cote d'Ivoire and a few other countries um, on the Western Belt, you're seeing that there's there's a there's a there's a clear and 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 um, there's a clear need for civil society to sort of begin to fight this battle of making sure that we begin to put in the systems for um, data governance within um, Africa. Um, I think we're the last frontier right now for and 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 therefore there's a lot of um, entrepreneurs who are looking at the African market. It's young, um, it's tech savvy, it's, um, there's a lot of opportunity here. But for us to be able to take full advantage of that, what would need to happen is that we would need to actually develop um, the protection mechanisms that are, um, are needed. Um, during the COVID years, we were working together with a number of civil society organizations from around the continent um, on a project that we called uh, Restore Data Rights. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to say, um, during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, times, many governments were actually taking people's um, data and sharing it, um, you know, under the guise of the emergency that was there. But we saw, um, for example, in Uganda, data shared um, by the Ministry of Health to, um, so it was shared by the Ministry of Health to the tax agency and somebody was actually arrested for tax fraud. But they would not have, a, um, have arrested this person for tax if they did not have their, their health data. And so one of the things that we were saying is that there is no absolutely no way that your data should be shared between um, one, one government agency to another or should be shared between one uh, business to another and so on without your permission and without you understanding that this data was taken for this purpose. 
this is not an easy thing to um, establish, but it's it's a it's a fight that is worth um, you know sort of um, taking on, um, and we are happy to see that in around the continent over the years, over the last three four years, there's been an increased um, level of engagement um, on the questions of data governance as much as possible. We are right now working on a project with a number of other civil society organizations to try and establish a unified data governance framework for East Africa. So what we have, we have, it's a conversation that we are starting to have now, but the idea of that conversation is to try and figure out if you are coming to the six countries of East Africa, being Kenya, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, South Sudan, Burundi, um, DRC, if you're coming to these countries, then how are you going to come? If Facebook wants to invest or, or X or one of these other companies wants to invest, how do they come into this? Um, and what are the um, requirements um, in terms of behavior that they must, um, they must have? Um, and so we're, we're excited that um, we're, not alone, we're not a lone voice um, that, as we used to be. Um, and we're excited that there are many other um, sort of um, types of organizations like universities, like uh, um, businesses that are also getting into that conversation. Um, and, and driving it forward. Thanks so much for that. Um, I just want to follow up just a little bit on that point and with the EAC. Um, do you think that this is something where civil society organizations, regional approach and, and bringing in the private sector could actually do more on, right? Is this something that Kenya should tackle alone, Burundi should tackle alone? Or is this something that really, at a regional level, might be uh, it might be an interesting approach to kind of foster, which has to work, which happens first. Well, you see, when when people are seeking to invest um, right now in this in this part of the world, they think about numbers and they think about the fact that East Africa um, uses your market of more than a hundred million people. Um, so when you're investing in a place, you think about the potential for scale. So you're not going to be thinking about um, going to Uganda um, by itself or Burundi by itself. You're going to be thinking about, OK, I'll go into Uganda first, but with the potential of actually going into Kenya, South Sudan, you know, and spreading out my wings, right? Now, if that's the case, then um, there's need for, for, you know, there's need for our civil society to sort of come together and have an integrated approach to thinking about how this development is happening so that it takes advantage or so that it puts our people at an advantage. Otherwise, what will happen is that it will be a repeat of um, our colonial era where we have people who came, um, you know, took over land and, and farmed and took a lot of resources away and those, and that resources was, was processed elsewhere. Um, it, in fact, if we're not careful, the investment that is being done in technology right now and in AI and all of these things could very easily be like the investment that was done decades ago in chocolate, where up until today, farmers who are growing uh, cocoa have never tested chocolate because of the fact that it is not produced in their countries, but it is produced in, um, in other places. There will be, there's a risk of us having a situation where we are um, workers um, for for these companies, we are um, the raw material that is being uh, used to um, annotate um, for driverless cars, but we ourselves never get to drive the driverless cars. So it requires for us as civil society, especially, to come together and to begin to think about what systems um, and processes. How do we make sure that our people are ready? How do we upskill our people so that they engage at a higher level um, with some of these issues. So that by the time um, the investments are being made, um, those investments find our people ready for two things, to buy, but also to produce. So Al, we're starting to get a little bit into not only what kind of mechanisms and behavior needs to be in place from governments and businesses, but also on the other side of that, um, 
citizen um, awareness and action as well. And one of the programs that Open Institute is working on, um, let me know if I, how I pronounce this, uh, Fika Uchi. Um, Picha Uchi. Uh, one more time. Picha Uchi. Picha Uchi. Yeah. We'll have that edited. Picha Uchi is focused on promoting citizen awareness and data protection. So you've already touched on this a little bit, but can you tell us about how this initiative, what, like why it was so urgent in Kenya and how this initiative is currently expanding? Well, I'll tell you, um, so Ficha Uchi means uh, hide your nakedness in, in Swahili. Um, and it was a euphemism for us to say, you know, protect yourself. Um, the story I think starts with my career as a stalker. Um, I, I have, uh, I have a few years' experience as a stalker. And, You're going to have uh, to explain that part <laughs> about the cyber stalking. <laughs> um, Listeners may tune my, out right as you say that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so before anybody panics, my career as a stalker started in a supermarket. Um, in Kenya, we pay, um, you know, using mobile money. Um, and for a long time, what would happen is that we would go to the counter and you tell somebody your phone number, you tell the teller your phone number, um, they would key it in onto their system and you would get a, an OTP just to put in your PIN and you've paid. Um, but when I was standing at the till, just about to pay, there was a lady in front of me who gave her number and it was a really easy number to, um, you know, there are some numbers that are really easy, you know, 011888 type numbers that are really easy to grasp. So I, I heard the number and I grasped it and I put it into true color. When I put it into true color, I learned that her name is Claudine Lim. I'm using you as an example, Claudine. I, I learned that her name is Claudine Lim. Um, when I learned that, I went to Facebook and I checked Claudine Lim and I saw pictures of where she lived and I saw pictures of her children and places she had gone. And in the about on Facebook, I saw she had gone to Strathmore University. I saw where she used to work and so on and so forth. Then after that, I went on Twitter and I found more pictures and more information about her. I went to Instagram, I found pictures of her children and so on and so forth. And, I, and it occurred to me just how serious and how dangerous this is. So I actually put out a tweet. Um, if you check out the, uh, a tweet around about Naivas, you will see the entire thread that I put it, where I describe this process. <laughs> while hiding um, the identity of this person, of course. Um, but then I said, look, guys, uh, there is a danger here. There's a danger that when we are standing at the supermarket, we're actually giving people more information than we intended. But there's also a danger in the fact that when we go onto social media, we don't really think about the things that we are posting. We don't think about, we take a picture next to our car and we show everybody our license plate and we don't realize that that's an issue. We take a picture next to the gate of your house and the house number is, is written right there. And some of these houses are very distinct. Some of the neighborhoods are very distinct. So I can almost tell exactly where you live. Um, and so we realized that this is a danger and this is a, it's a problem. Um, and so that was rectified by the supermarkets and, and our Safaricom and that was great. But then over time, we have gone to continue to realize that this is a problem. When we started the Fichauchi campaign, we had sent our communications team to go out and just ask people what they understand by things like cookies, what are cookies. Um, we got them to ask, um, uh, what do you understand by data and so on and so forth. People told us cookies are biscuits, they are confectionery that you eat. Um, data is a, is a credit that you put on your phone so that you can be able to browse the internet, that sort of thing. Um, and we realized that that's a problem because Websites are actually telling you accept cookies um, and people are not reading. They're just hitting accept without thinking that they have accepted that this website can collect your browsing data and sell it to a third party um, without, you, without referring to you um, thereafter. And so we started a campaign to try and do um, data protection 101. Um, tell people what, what, um, what the dangers are. Tell people why they should care tell people what, what they should and should not post on social media, tell people um, why they should um, protect their children um, online, 
why they should you know put pictures of their children online without thinking about who can see those pictures um you know stuff like that and it was very very basic the campaign was actually very very basic and it was being targeted at the people who are already online who already use it and but it went a little bit further towards thinking about things like um you know in kenya we have because of um having had been a victim of terrorism every time you go into a building you're required to write um on a book um some details about yourself the three main details that they collect in this book which i call the book of truth is your name your phone number and your id number if i have these these three things it's not very difficult for me to get um control of your bank details it's not difficult for me to start getting control or access to some of the spaces that you wouldn't want me to get in fact um a few years ago just before the last elections we found that people had been added into political parties that they were not members of because of the fact that if i have these three details then i can add you as a member of my political party and show that my political party has a much greater following than maybe it it, it, it you know it does and that's simply because of the fact that these books of truth were being sold um, by people. And so we say that the reason I call it the book of truth is because I don't ever write my true details um, in the book. I, I lie through my teeth. I give a different name. I give a different number of my, my phone number. I give a different number for my ID um, so that they can access the building, but uh, while protecting my own data. So the feature which campaign was actually turned out to be very successful. Um, it had a reach of more than 5 million people. Um, it had more than 1.5 million people engaging with it. And we realized, oh, this is, is actually important knowledge that we're providing. And so we did it another a second year again um, to, to sort of push down the message. And now we have actually expanded it this year, where we are going to um, Uganda and Tanzania and doing the same campaign. So we are, not, we are doing this campaign in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda this year. Um, so that people, you know, you sort of push down the message and make sure that people understand and you make sure that you remind people to pay attention to their uh, data protection rights, to care about um, these particular issues and try and sensitize them on what, you know, what the dangers are if they're not careful about these things. So perhaps it's a little bit um, early, but would you say that there's any differences in the campaign from country to country? I don't know. Um, we, we, <laughs> I guess we'll soon find out um, because we've just um, literally just started the campaign in, in some of these other countries. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. So, Ali, you talked a little bit about the Ease Citizen Portal, and you, we've talked a lot this morning about, uh, let's say, citizen hygiene about their right. own personal data. What yeah. are some of the other topics that really kind of keep you up at night? So, for example, I know the eCitizen portal had sort of an attack against it recently. There was, yeah. you know, cybersecurity is, you have a lot of smart tech entrepreneurs and a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of cybersecurity hacks happening everywhere around the world. But what are some of the things that keep you up at night? When you think about sort of Kenya's digital transformation? Well, you know, right now, when I think about not just Kenya's digital transformation, but when I think about Africa's um, digital transformation, I think there's a bigger issue that um, plagues my mind um, and keeps me up at night, um, almost literally, and that is um, the marginalization of people. Um, I find, um, being that I live in a rural area, that people in rural and remote areas, the further away you are from the capital city of whichever country you are in, the further away you are from services, the further away you are from knowledge, the further away you are from engaging with government. Um, and there are so many people who just don't count um, in our countries. Um, they don't have ID cards. Um, they are systematically marginalized even in terms of education because you find that investments in education are done closer to the capital city and the farther away you go the schools are now made of mud the children are going to school in under trees they don't have access to books bookshops are not being opened in those places 
so they don't have access to libraries and so on and so on and so on. And so it becomes almost a systemic um, approach to marginalizing people and making sure that they are unable to access um, government services. They are unable to also represent themselves to those governments because if I don't have knowledge, if I don't know how to read, if I can't speak the, the languages that government speaks, being English in our case, for example, um, and you come and you make a presentation in English um, and you're presenting to me a pie chart full of data. In fact, I give you a real example is that um, we once went to um, do a, a survey around communities and we learned that most people all over the world, I think it is true, but most people don't care so much about what is happening at national level. They care about what is, they care more about what is happening within their community, within um, their spaces. So, um, for example, if we have no power, then I care more about the question of power than I care about whether or not an expressway was built. You know what I mean? And so um, when we learned this, we also learned that people don't understand the language that government speaks. Very often you will hear our president or our president of another country saying that we have spent $10 million on education programs in the country. If I have never held a million shillings, and you tell me that you've, you've spent billions of shillings. I don't understand what that means. I can't conceptualize what a billion means if, you know, my, my money is at 10,000 shillings. Um, and so when, when it is impossible for me to come and hold you to account, if you're telling me that you have you're built a road for, you, um, for a billion shillings, I don't know what roads cost. So I, you know, I have to take your word for it. But if you're telling me something that is within my realm of thinking, for example, a few years ago when we had just done open data, um, we were doing social accountability exercises in um, parts of the country. And in one part of the country, we found that they had built pit latrines for about $100,000 um, that were public toilets, but they were pit latrines. So everybody was asking, because I have built a pit latrine in my compound and it didn't cost me $1,000, so I need to understand what does this pit latrine that your builders have um, for it to cost $100,000. And when people investigated a little bit, they found that some of the leaders had actually taken a benchmarking tour to Singapore to see um, <laughs> what toilets look like in those places, you know, those sort of um, fancy things that are done. But you see, the only reason people were able to ask questions about that pit latrine was because of the fact that they understood I have built a pit latrine and therefore I understood what I understand what it costs. Now, the challenge that is existing um, when you go a little bit further is the question of, you know, how do you make sure that citizens from around the country, including people who are in rural and remote areas, are active citizenship, can, uh, have the confidence to actually go and speak to government and say, we don't want you to build a bridge, we want you to build a road. We don't want you to invest in another hospital. We want you to equip the nurses and the hospitals that we already have. But for me to be able to do that, I need to understand um, you know, what investments have been done and what the situation is. And I need to have the confidence. And confidence comes from knowledge. And knowledge comes from, in part, education. It comes from um, the fact that I'm not alone at the public participation meeting saying these things, all of these things. And so our theory right now is that um, we have to re-energize the civil society movement, but we have to do it from the bottom. And we have to invest in community-based organizations. And investing in community-based organizations means making sure that they have the necessary technical knowledge um, that they need to have so that they can you know, build the capacity of the people. Making sure that they have money so that they can be able to um, be responsive to the needs of their communities, making sure that they have a community of, or, and a network of others so that nobody is doing anything alone. When you're fighting for democracy or for human rights, sometimes that is life-threatening uh, work and it helps when you have numbers around. And so we, need, we, we are investing, we are doing our part uh, at the Open Institute by creating a space called Maona Space here in Kilifi. Um, and Maono space is, is, a, is a space, is a co-working space that we created for community-based organizations. So that these community-based organizations can network, they can collaborate, 
they can engage with each other. And while they do that, then they can go and serve their communities better. Um, and while they do that, we provide them with technical knowledge. So we will make sure that we introduce them to other organizations that are doing the things that they're doing. Um, and it is information on um, women and girls' uh, rights. It is information on human rights. It's information on governance. It's information on democracy. All of this kind of information. Also, we are trying to build their capacity to make sure that as organizations, they are strong. They can manage their money well. They can manage their HR well. They can do um, best practices with regard to growing and sustainability and all these things. And then after that, we give them mini grants um, at the Open Institute um, so that they do whatever it is that they, we, we make sure that those mini grants are as flexible as possible so that they do whatever it is that they feel is important. An important lesson that we've learned in the last two years is communities do not have thematic areas. So if communities don't have thematic areas, we think that the entire philanthropic space shouldn't have um, thematic areas. Instead, money should actually be flexible so that it allows for um, communities to respond to whatever it is. One of our members has done uh, a documentary that I think they'll release um, in a month or so where they found that in some communities, um, many, many projects go undone. And the reason for that is because Catherine came um, to this community in a, land, in a big land cruiser vehicle. She said, um, I want to know about your needs for water. And because A, she's white, B, she has a big land cruiser, she looks like she has a lot of money. Um, it means that we must cry and make sure that we complain that we do not have water and that life is bad. And of course, some of those things are true, but sometimes we, it helps us to exaggerate these um, stories a little bit so that we make sure that Catherine is sufficiently um, moved so that she can live a million shillings for us to build a borehole. Now, is a borehole the thing that we need in our community at this particular time? Is it the most urgent thing? Maybe, maybe not. When Catherine goes away and the pump of the borehole gets spoiled, we don't do anything. We wait for Catherine to come back and fix her borehole so that we can continue to fetch water because it was never our borehole. There are so many stories of international NGOs that have built boreholes, that have um, gone to schools and provided desks and things like that. But having gone away, those projects have died. In one community, when um, the documentary was being shot, I was very amused to hear that as soon as the cameras came out, this lady who was supposed to be interviewed had just come from church and she was, you know, her hair was on flick. She looked really beautiful. She had really nice dress and everything. But as soon as the cameras came out, she went back into her house, looked for her most ugly dress, um, roughed up her hair, put on a, a shawl around it, so that she came, she came out looking all haggardy and, and poor and everything. And when she was asked why she did it, she said, you know, you have to do this so that the donors can give you money. We have to get rid of the theater of development and start doing development seriously. And if we need to do development seriously, then what that means for me is that we must go down to the communities and start working at their terms, on their terms, not on ours. What that means also, is that philanthropists have got to stop dictating um, the terms of, uh, upon which they give money. They've got to give money based on where it is needed and how it is going to be spent. And we have to start trusting community-based organizations. And the only way we start trusting them is if we build their capacity and then let them fix their communities. Because who can hold a community-based organizations to account best? The communities where they work. You cannot do it from Seattle, I cannot do it from Nairobi. It has to be done at community level. I a thousand percent agree. Um, I've worked in, uh, I came from the private sector, but uh, I worked in, I've worked in development for about 20 years. And it's the only, I think because I came from the private sector, which is very much like you have a customer and you provide a service, right? It's a very, it's a very clear line between who's right. doing what. And yeah. Then I entered this world and and a, a colleague at the global health NGO I worked at, he goes, this is the problem with development. I still think it's the best description. He goes, there's a user, a chooser, and a dues payer. And you have right. subverted this entire relationship yes. of who's doing things. And 
that, as you said, you know, money is programmed because I have a health, I have health outcomes that I need to achieve. I have education outcomes that I have to achieve. So when you come in with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And the power right. imbalance because of the financing and because of the sort of the other, I, I'm, a, I, I'm very happy. Actually, I do think it is shifting and I do think, you know, I do give groups some, you know, some credit for really kind of shifting their approach. But I think for it to be more than just true words, you really have got to yeah. break that. I, I think you've got to break the sectoral part for sure. I mean, it's actually why yeah. I switched from global health. I'm not putting this in the recording, but just so you know, like yeah. why I switched from global health to starting dial, because I was so frustrated as a technologist that we were pushing these projects that might help in health but would right. never work at a national scale <sighs> simply because the Ministry of Health relative to a Ministry of Planning, a Ministry of ICT or the President's Office is really weak. And so you yes. don't really have that ability to kind of, it might be a great national scale health program, but it isn't really going to work other than that. And I mm. was so, I was like, we're just going to leave technology. I've worked in too many clinics and too many places where stuff is just like piled up because the project ended and nobody knew how to maintain it or run it. And you have no community ownership because they didn't pick it or want it in the first place. Right, exactly. In fact, I can tell you for a fact that um, the... the This is a huge rant of mine, so sorry. To, <laughs> you know, you know the, the, thing I, the thing that I call, I call, I call it the theater of development. I love and that. Let, I thought that was brilliant. Was let, like, let me tell you a couple that's of stories. Staying on the, that'll stay in the recording for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the theater of development. And let me tell you a couple of stories about what I consider the theater of development. A few years ago, um, we, were, uh, we, we were partners of a certain organization that was, um, you know, a technology organization. And at that time, apps were the, the rage. In fact, hackathons and, and apps were the, all the rage. Um, and, you know, in the, in the way that- I have had a very booming business for this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, in fact, you, you just mentioned something that is interesting, that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a, you know, a nail, right? Um, so at that time, um, donors had, would, would, had given the signal that, so long as you're doing a hackathon or you're doing something around technology, you'll get all kinds of money. And we saw um, people who are building some very mediocre apps get even millions of dollars um, to build those things. Now, one organization came to Kenya and they went and collected data on election polling stations. They put, the, they put a database of election polling stations online and then um, we had our elections. And then I went to a conference later and I saw them put a picture of um, a long line, a winding line of, um, of, uh, of, of people waiting to vote. And then they said that because of this tool that they had built, which was just showing people where election stations were, there was a massive turnout of um, people to vote which simply was not true. They, after that, got $4 million um, from donors out of that conference. That's story number one. Story number two is we went into a community where we counted a full 25 projects that have failed, have been started and failed. And the way that all of those 25 projects were done was that International NGO X came said that we want to give you goats. Of course, nobody's going to say, no, we don't want your goats. So they took the goats. And as soon as International and X has left, they sold the goats or they ate them. Then they came, another one came with chickens and we ate chicken. Another one came with um, fish ponds. And when they left, the fish ponds had algae on them. This is the real situation that we are finding. We went recently to a community and they and when they saw us, they said, you know, we want your help because our well is has a crack and is no longer valuable. So I don't know if you know how wells are done, but you know, wells usually have a protruding little wall that comes out of the ground. Just where yeah, that I grew wall, up on a farm. <laughs> right. So just where yeah. the well the well is touching the ground, 
there was a crack on it. And so when they, were, they would fetch the water, some of the spillage would find its way back into the well and dirtify the water because um, through that crack. And so I asked them, um, have you found out how much it is to fix this crack? They said, no, I didn't. Because you see, Catherine came years ago and gave us this well. Um, and you know we don't have the right to tamper with other people's things. We are very respectful of other people's things. And I'm like, but isn't this your own community's well? I'm not going to go and look for somebody else to do another well. If you have this one and you could find out, do you know how much it was to fix that crack? $30. A dollar. Yeah, I'd be like a dollar. It was $30. Some mortar and a little bit of time. It was some mortar, <laughs> um, some cement, and, um, uh, you know, their husbands uh, of those women were already people who work in this industry, and they already knew what to do about it. When, I, when they realized that that is all it took, those women actually took charge of that well in such a powerful way, because not only did they fix the crack, but they also created a little veranda around them they figured out where they need to be sitting while they wait for somebody else to, uh, to fetch water. So they built a little chair and a little bench and so on and so forth. And they sort of took charge of their own lives. This is the thing that we need to do. We need to get rid of the theater that is um, of development and start to actually make sure that we're actually um, achieving real development progress. Because otherwise, we're just playing and wasting money. So this last question, which Claude is going to ask, um, but you could, right now it has, what advice would you give to another country? I wonder instead, based on the conversation we just had, do you want to have, what advice would you give to international donors? Would you rather do that? Um, yeah, I would much rather do that. And, and yeah. what else? <laughs> Feel free, because I, I have a like, powerful voice. <laughs> You know, if I, if I had the chance to speak to donors, and I and I I think <laughs> sometimes I'm I think told that yeah. <laughs> some, sometimes I'm told that this is a, a dangerous thing for me to do, but I think I would say um, donors now need to shift the power and shift the power away from themselves to the recipients of this money. I think number one, most of the money that comes out of philanthropy should make its way all the way down the community-based organizations, the ones who will spend $1,000 and do way more with $1,000 than a large national NGO will do if they were doing the same job. And we proved that last year because of the fact that we gave $1,000 to a couple of organizations and they went to um, about 80 villages to sensitize them on public participation. We could never have achieved that because of the fact that if I were to bring people to Malindi to come and sensitize people in a village, I have to think about nice hotels. I have to think about hiring a car. I have to think about uh, flights um, to Malindi and so on and so forth. Community-based organizations will take that $1,000 and they will take it exactly where it is needed. And because of the fact that they are moving around in motorbikes, life is a lot cheaper at that level. So this is one major information that I wanted to give to um, large philanthropy organizations. Please shift the power and shift the, the, where the money goes. Of course, they do not want to have the burden of distributing $1,000 to many people. Let them give the, the money to whoever it is that they're giving it to, even now. Let them give the money to um, the international NGO that they like. Let them give money to the national NGO that they like. But let the national and international NGO not presume to go down to the ground to implement the projects. Instead, let them give the money to community-based organizations so that those community-based organizations do it. One reason why that works, one reason why it is going to be extremely sustainable for that to be done is this. Who can tell you that you smell, Catherine? Who My can children. tell you that you smell? <laughs> You know, and it can only be your children because you trust them. You know they have your interests at heart. I cannot come to Seattle and tell you, Catherine, man, you need to take a shower. That's not possible. In the same way, we have to trust community-based organizations because they live within the communities. They have the trust of those communities. They have the, the 
locus standi within that community to say some things and they understand what the community is afraid of in ways that we will never understand. So the, the first thing I would say is shift the money, but then again, shift the power as well. Let's kill this thing called thematic areas because those thematic areas, 80% of the time are not responsive um, to the needs of the community that they're supposed to be serving. In fact, what they do is that because now I know Catherine is philanthropist and her thematic area is women and girls, even if the main issue in, in my community is boys, I will say that I'm needing a money for women and girls so that I get the money from, from, from Catherine because everybody must try and get the money whichever way they can do and then save whatever it is. Number three, let money be flexible. Let money stop being um, program funding that is over prescriptive is the worst thing to happen, to happen in development. Because what has happened, and I've seen this in even my own organization, where we have received that kind of program funding that is so prescriptive, what happens is that eventually it becomes about ticking the box. We, we committed ourselves to buying a laptop. Even if we don't need to buy the laptop, we buy the laptop. Those principles and those games that we have been playing over the years are games that I think the entire industry, all the way from philanthropy organizations, all the way to through NGOs to large NGOs at national level, to all the way down to community-based organizations. It's time for us to look at all of this and change that um, system so that now we start to do real development and start to make sure that money goes where it's supposed to be and we stop inflating costs where they should not be inflated. Because sometimes we go and we, we are asking to buy an iPhone for $5,000, but we all know that an, an iPhone is nine ninety nine. You know what I mean? We have to now start to be a lot more realistic with how some of these projects are done. Todd, um, do you want to, since Al gave a very eloquent answer, I'll put your question, you, you read the question and then I'll move the recording around a little bit. Amaya? Sure. So Al, my final question is, what advice would you give to international donors or funders that are considering investing in digital transformation? And what kind of choices should they make first? Excellent. Ask and answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's about it for us. Do you have anything else you want to say or add on to this? Well, I think the, the thing that I would say is, I've really had fun in this, uh, um, being part of this podcast and having this conversation with you, Catherine and Claudine. I think the things that we've talked about today, um, especially in that last part where we're talking about the, the theater of development, I think it's stuff that we really need to spend a lot of time um, talking about and trying to change. Because if we, are to achieve, we have such little time to achieve so much um, if we are thinking about the SDGs. We have such little time to achieve so much if we are thinking about how many people are marginalized and how many people are being left behind and how many people are actually going in poverty and how wide the, the um, gap between the rich and the poor is getting. So we have a lot to do. We can't do it if we're playing games um, in this sector. And I think the moment of reckoning has come. And so I'm really excited that I was able to have this conversation with you and I look forward to having even more. Um, I hope you'll have me back um, in your podcast um, a few episodes from now, um, I, I would be very happy to be a regular uh, here. Al Claudine, thank you so much for joining Digital Decisions. Um, really appreciate it. And Al, um, thanks again for sharing all of your thoughts about uh, not only how to do data protection more effectively, but really how to bring people, governments, and the private sector together, as well as, quite honestly, just how to do development better. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much.